Well, welcome everybody back to uh, another episode of Church Stories. Uh, just an opportunity to take some stories, some planters, uh, to bring them to the forefront and, and just to highlight some of their ministry and everything that they're doing in and through their ministry at their church. Today we have uh, David Lemagne with uh, Epic Church and just grateful for his time to be with us this morning. So David, why don't you take a minute and uh, just take, tell us a little bit about yourself, uh, a little bit about your, your journey from your church, the, the city that you're in, and, and just some, some nuts and bolts of just a high level view of, of what you do at Epic Church. Sure. Yeah. Well, um, like I said, I'm David Lemagne and I'm originally from the Chicago area and I I remember in the third grade, I specifically pointed at a state map or the map of the United States. And I said, I would never live in Kansas. And here I am uh, about, it was about 20 years later, I found myself living in the state of Kansas. Uh, My wife's from here. Uh, We met in college and um, we've been married for about coming up on 15 years at the end of the year. We got three kids and um, you know, I, I grew up in a kind of a little bit of a divided home, you know, mom, mom would take us to church. Dad didn't, you know, think they, you know, we were a family, but it's just on different paths and probably didn't start my faith journey until I was going to college and then uh, made the commitment to go into ministry at that point. Um, uh, While I was in college, I, I say I accidentally planted a church out of a gas station and I had no idea that I would be doing it, you know, 15 years later, again, here in Wichita, Kansas. And so it's been a little bit of a ride. Um, I did. I was not the original planter for Epic Church. A uh, guy who did is a guy who I've become friends with since, a guy named Kent Wagner. Uh, he was going at it for five years, a year on the ground, and then f- four years after it launched. And uh, the church has had just struggled to really find uh, where it was going to be and it really come into its own. And, uh, after he had stepped out, they had, they had lost a building. They were trying to go in. They had lost a youth pastor who had been unfaithful. They had, uh, lost a children's minister. And, uh, I got a call from a guy named Phil Claycomb, just this guy at Nexus who we probably all know now, and uh, my wife and I had moved to Wichita just to kind of see if she'd further her education. And I was looking just for any work whatsoever. And Phil called and said, hey, would you like to plant a church? And I said, no. And then he said, well, can I still buy you lunch? And I, that's that's the easy way to my heart. So I said, yes. And um, I came home that day and my wife said, you didn't tell him no, did you? And I said, no. I got this coaching and mentoring thing, but then I talked myself out of it. And long story short, I jumped into Epic thinking I'd be their interim guy who would help them close the doors that, Hey, we learned some things, but now we take those lessons and be a part of the kingdom somewhere else. And that was six and a half years ago. So uh, obviously a lot's changed. We, we were probably about 35 people then. Now there's probably 120 or so people who call Epic home We've baptized 60 people. We have given away $100,000 to church planting. And as of uh, two weeks ago, we bought our facility, a facility that we'll move into in December. Wow. That's awesome, man. Yeah. Yeah. We did not know back then that we'd be on this ride. For sure. Well, very cool. What, uh, what's, what's been uh, the the biggest thing in, in your heart and your ministry as far as what uh, what do you love most about um, just your role? I mean, obviously not the the initial planter, but just kind of coming in and, and and nurturing along over the last several years. What's been your favorite part about what you've been doing? You know, I th- I think it's changed over the years. You know, you go in wondering what you could do, and then after you get some people who buy into the vision, and all, mainly, you know, most of our people who've come to us have not had a real serious prior experience with Christ. And it really shifts from what you can do to the idea of what they can do and seeing ministry come out of our people uh, is, you know, I, it, that's probably the thing that's been driving me more and more. I, I, I found myself falling less in love with 
what I'm able to do as a pastor and more in love with what Christ is doing through our people. And so to watch that transformation from a person who comes in, who thinks they're just got some questions and trying to see if a church service can answer that, or they got some kids and they think, oh, well, now it's that time where our family gets to do the normal American thing where we get into a church to them becoming a disciple who sees the need to make disciples of other people. That's, that's the, st- I, I, I could wake up every day for that. Yeah, man. That's good stuff. How's uh what's the journey been like for your family during this season? Oh, that's, that's been fun. <laughs> um, yeah. You know, it's, it's strange because you come in and, you know, I, I'd worked in, you know, established churches for, for years and, I, and previously I'd worked in esta- older established churches that were kind of, they had to make a decision where they're going to grow or die. And thankfully they made the decision to grow and to make healthy decisions. But with that came the challenges uh, of change. And so sometimes you're used to how the church world deals with things. And you bring that into a church that doesn't have any of that DNA, but you do. And so I, I think there was some unlearning for us, for how we would have to handle things before to how we could handle things in a new environment. And, you know, there was, there was some hurts, some baggage that we brought with us that we had experienced in previous churches that we had to, one, not teach the church that we were coming into, but two, also not um, misinterpret the things we experienced in that lens. Um so if someone struggled with something, maybe it wasn't because, you know, they had had this maybe uh, traditional baggage that they were holding on to, but a life experience. And maybe we weren't dealing with someone who was a legalist, but maybe someone who just didn't understand uh, the difference between kingdom living and worldly living yet. And, and having to, you know, forgive things from our past and and struggle through um was this me now to lead these people in our present i i think that was one of the big things you know for for both me and my wife you know relearning what does it mean for me to be the pastor and what her role was and some of the freedoms that came with it and do we really trust that we have this freedom now as opposed to before when it was like well we got to be careful because this person likes this and that person likes that and how do you tow that line? Um, we had to trust that the people who we were teaching about freedom actually believed in it because that was their first experience with it. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. So you meant, I mean, just talking about your wife and how you guys have walked through some of that stuff. What is, um, for, for maybe your personal life and your personal family, what's, uh, what's planting a church been like, uh, at home? You know, uh, I wish I I could say that I was uh, dad of the year sometimes. There was definitely plenty of times where I thought I had to handle things I didn't have to handle. And so time away and time devoted to things where I thought, well, this is where I had to put this work at this moment. Um, I I didn't have to do as much, but, you know, you, you almost think of it as your baby. And so you know, when you've, when you've got your first kid, you know, you try to do everything right and watch everything and watch what they eat and sleep and schedules. Second kid, you're a little looser. And the third one, you know, as long as they're not playing in a litter box, you're, you're pretty much okay. And learning to kind of trust that, you know, this is God's child more than yours. Um, and, and me letting me trusting God in that has then allowed me to focus more on my family where, where I should have been to begin with. And so, um, you know, I would say that there's definitely been times where there were struggles in that, but as I've grown and, and be, and allowed God to be the father of his church and taken more of my role to be the father of my family, I've watched them actually enjoy the freedom of being a part of the church more. Um, and then as a husband, I think the more that I allowed my wife to pursue her dreams, the more she saw this as a joint effort, you know, not just, you know, you know, I, I think sometimes we, we get so worried about, you know, well, if our spouse isn't playing this role or that role in our church, then, then how will that look? 
And we want our spouses really to experience the same freedom in Christ that we're telling everyone else that they, they can have. Yeah, sure. And so my wife got to go through school, got her master's degree, uh, is working as a school counselor now. And, you know, she's really enjoying that role. And it's in turn allowed her to enjoy more the role she has in the church. Very cool. Well, tell us, uh, I mean, obviously 2020 has been a little crazy. Um, but but through through this season, what is what's been a story or or some life change or or something significant that's kind of taken place um, that you've just seen God's hand in uh, for your church and your ministry during uh, just the last six months or so? Sure. Well, um, for us, our last Sunday meeting before the quarantine was March fifteenth. We were supposed to have some baptisms that day. We were really pumping up for some things. And I think that's just the weekend where they were saying, hey, the next day we're on a stay-at-home order. And so immediately, even though we had that weekend to be together, we saw probably only 30 people in church that day. I mean, it was amazing just to see what shifted. And we probably, we only got to do one of the baptisms that we had planned that day. And, and I mean, it was all understandable, you know, everyone's worried about their health and, but we really had a burden during that time of, we needed to do something more than just put on an online service for the next however, however long, um, everyone was going to go to online services and, and they should, you know, you still want to communicate with your people, worship together, give them the idea that, Hey, we're still here during this, this time. But we really felt like, you know, in in the ancient church, they dealt with lepers during that time. So what were we going to deal with? And I, I'm I'm actually I didn't mean for this, but I'm wearing a Wichita Zulus Hero shirt. It's a group in town that deals with uh, autoimmune deficient kids, either terminally ill or chronically ill kids. And it's a it's a charity in town. They're not a Christian group necessarily, but um, but they just do great work with these families. And we had struck up a relationship with them in previous years doing Easter bunny visits to their home because their kids couldn't go to the mall and see the Easter bunny. And, but during this time we decided we needed to bring them the care packages because it was especially dangerous for them to go out when they could bring something home to an autoimmune deficient child. And so we, 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 on three separate occasions, we ended up going to somewhere around 330 families during this time and bringing care packages, we'd bring the hand sanitizer, the Lysol wipes, uh, the, y- y- the gloves, the masks, we were bringing all those things. We brought uh, sanitary items. And we also said we brought sanity items. We brought toys and games and books for the kids who were stuck at home. And then we also ended up doing a, a major grocery run. And all in all, I think we had just from our church and some of the donations we were able to procure and discounts from places. I think there was somewhere around six or $7,000 worth of items we were able to bring these families. Wow. And, you know, the one thing that really stood out, I feel was there were, there were the churches that were during this time say that, Hey, we're worried about who's attending our services, who, who viewed our services. And then there was going to be the churches that were going to be the hands and feet of Jesus. And we got to see our church. Uh, deliver those packages to all those families consistently and just see the the immediate difference in their lives. Yeah, very cool. And you guys have been doing something uh, a little interesting I see on Facebook, and I'm not sure if you guys were doing this pre-quarantine or, or whatnot, but it's kind of always like the, the church on Monday, the church oh. on Monday. What's, uh, what's that little bit? Yeah, one of the things I felt people just needed to hear during that time was just encouragement that, you know, we it was just a short thought for the day because none of us really have the time. But if people could just have three minutes to spend time remembering what their faith is for, that it was for a moment like that, like, hey, we're, we're people who feel like we're in exile Man, that that message is all over scripture. We're people who are afraid to go out. We're afraid of what could happen to us. And that message is all over scripture. That everything we've been saying pre-quarantine was designed for what we're going through now. And so if we believe this, then, then we need to believe it when things are hard. 
And so it was just a way to give some encouragement, some hope, to inspire people to do some good, uh, to challenge people to not act foolishly during that time, but to be conscious of their neighbors in a way that maybe the church has not been presented until this quarantine. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. No, and that's great. I've uh, definitely seen that personally where you have, um, that I think the quarantine has actually been a really good thing for a lot of churches to just step back and see um, what's what's really important when you don't have Sunday mornings, when you don't have big services or the show on Sunday to, to attract people or bring people in. Mm-hmm. You know, it's really easy to just show up to church and, and walk out and go on with the rest of your life. And, you know, you have your you know little Christian stamp for the week and, and that's good. What are, I mean, some of what you were saying already, but what's what's one of the most profound ways that you think that this season will will change the way that you do ministry moving forward? You know, I think what kind of what I was touching on before is, are we going to be a church that does church services or do we see ourselves as a church that's serving? And, it, you know, one of the things we talked about was even though we couldn't meet together, we probably had our best season as a church during this three months. Yeah which is a weird thing to say, you know, I could say, well, you know, I didn't get as many any clicks or views as I would have hoped that we did, but yeah. the way our people were empowered, the way they sacrificed, I mean, you know, some guy gave me a bottle of clam juice during this time. And I just said, you know, Hey, if, if I raise a thousand bucks, we'll, I'll drink it. Well, we ended up raising $2,200 and then people, bought more items and people were really going out of their way to serve their, their neighbors. And we saw people do stuff outside of just what our church offered to do. People were going to nursing homes and painting on their windows to kind of cheer up people. I mean, just some really amazing stories of people thinking of others in very selfless ways. And on top of it, for us not being able to meet, I think we saw our offering go up 40 some percent Wow! during this time. And I think it's because we got to say during this time while we're giving stuff away and doing things that it wasn't about, hey, can you support David during his salary? You know, he's he's still got a home to pay for his, his mortgage on. And it was about vision. It was about, hey, we are we are attacking this community. You know, we're we're going all over Any, anywhere. The virus is stopping our community. We're going to go and do something good. And I think people saw that they, when they were giving, it wasn't to keep the lights on or to pay the rent. It was, or, or to do an advertisement campaign. Like we were planning to do an, an Easter bunny visit this year, which obviously we couldn't do that. And it's like, well, this was 20 times better than any Easter bunny visit we could have done. Yeah. And so we got to see our people transform in it. And it's like, well, if this isn't the kind of ministry we do going forward, then what's the point? Yeah. Oh, that's great, man. So what's uh, what's next for Epic Church? Well, s- something else we did during this time that, you know, I I guess it's, if there's a way not to do things during a quarantine, I could do it. But we, we bought a building during this time. We bought a Jewish temple or synagogue here in Wichita um, that is more centrally located to the city that there's not a visible church for about a mile radius. And uh, it's near the VA hospital, a lot of our recovery communities and a lot of businesses that we could partner with to really uh, reach out and make a difference in this part of the community. Awesome, man. There's a lot of, a lot of transition there. So what is, uh, what's your timeline for all that? Well, thankfully, we got a little bit of time. We're under contract. One of the things that was very important for this group was that they got to finish out uh, some of their holidays and say goodbye to the building. And uh, we so we will be closing officially no later than December 7th. They want to start Hanukkah in their new building. And so we have six months to plan to canvas the community to basically go through another launch phase. Uh, but to really prepare ourselves for what will that look like when we say we're opening up to this community, are we ready for everyone who's going to come in? Um, and thankfully, we've had some 
great things offered to us. A number of churches have partnered with us to provide chairs and kitchen equipment and offer work days. And then we had uh, one of our elders, uh, her, his daughter-in-law has offered to help us with the social media campaign. This is what she does for a, a living for businesses that are launching into a community. Wow. And she said, hey, we want to help you do yours. And so to watch God already kind of orchestrating and weaving these things together ahead of us and knowing that we have a half year to be ready and to plan and to, and to really open up well. We, we are looking forward to having Christmas Eve services in our own facility that December. Wow, man. And so kind of soft fun. launching there and then hard launching, especially again for Easter. Yeah. Um, we're really looking forward to it. Very exciting. Man. Well, that's cool. Well, uh, we're not going to go back for a, a second. Um, uh, just kind of our last question here, but what is what is the role that Nexus has played uh, in in your heart and your ministry as you've gone through that from the, from the first lunch with uh, Mr. Phil Claycomb where you couldn't say no? Um, what's what's life been like with Nexus through through the years? Yeah, I have a lot of grievances with Phil. <laughs> no. <laughs> you know, I, I, here I am, six and a half years later. I was supposed to be out of this three months later. You know, but uh, no, you know, honestly. The way Nexus came alongside of us and the role that they played of offering the coaching. And, you know, they were already with Epic before I came. And so when I came in and we were in a, a lurch, even though we had, Epic had technically passed some of those code pre coaching phases that they were already uh, c compensated for, they knew that their daughter church was in trouble. And without, expecting anything in return they came alongside and said not only are we going to assess this guy and see if he's equipped to do this but we're going to provide the coaching and the mentoring for for him even though we had already provided that previously we're going to provide that now and they made sure that i had everything i had weekly coaching with greg garcia which you know if for some of the new guys he, he was probably likely to give him an ulcer you know, being prepared for those meetings. Um, no, I, I love Greg. Um, but incidentally, he loves the movie Up. <laughs> he gets very emotional every time he watches that movie. He's going to love me for saying that. Um, but but also connecting us with the partners, uh, it, it's it's kind of crazy. He They connected us with the CEA of Kansas, Christian Evangelist Association of Kansas, and now I, I've ended up as the president of that organization as of this year. And so, uh, I mean, just teaching us to not just survive as a church and to have a good launch as a church, but how to actually play a role in planting churches. And now we have helped plant, we have a granddaughter church. We've planted, uh, uh, helped plant two churches in Kansas and one now a granddaughter church in Kansas. So, so three churches there, uh, we're helping plant another church in Utah. And then also we've done some with mid India church partners who's come out to see us. Um, it, it's help that without Nexus one, I, I don't think that our church would be here today. I think the story would have ended six and a half years ago, but I also don't think that we would have had a vision to see a church multiplication movement in our region and beyond. And so to, to have the investment to not only just see us and what could we do to start a church in our particular space, but to see us as people who could start future churches in other places, um, it just gave us a vision beyond ourselves, which is what I think not just helped us survive, but to thrive. Yeah, I mean, that's awesome. Well, uh, I, yeah, I mean, we could sit here and talk for, for quite a while, man, but I, I appreciate you just giving us a snapshot into where you guys have come from, all the all the ministry that you've been able to do, and just excited for, for the next season of what Epic looks like as you guys move into a new facility and uh, just to continue this strong ministry, uh, especially coming out of this insane season that we've all been kind of thrust into. But uh, any any last words, last thoughts? You know, I, I I think the big thing that I've really latched on to probably over the last six and a half years is 
is enjoying being a hero maker instead of a hero. And I know that that idea came from Ralph Moore, who came out to several of our Nexus things, has really kind of shaped the way we look at our ministries. But the more that I, I'm comfortable letting go of what have I done or my legend or my story or all the prideful elements that I have in my heart, the more that God works on that and the more that I that I see his body do things, you know, the more that I've just enjoyed this ride and been able to have fun with it, but also handle some of the problems that have naturally come up just from dealing with sin in the life of people and the brokenness of people. Um, you know, I, I would say give, give it all away. Don't be afraid to let any of it go um, because it's not ours anyways. We can't hold on to it. Awesome, man. Well, thank you so much for taking a few minutes to, uh, to share with us, David. We really appreciate your, uh, your ministry there. And uh, just pray that God would continue to do an amazing work in and through Epic. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. And, and you as well. I, I, I've really appreciated uh, your contributions to Nexus since you jumped on board. It's, it's, it's meant a lot for our ministry. Awesome. Well, thanks, man. Look forward to uh, continuing our relationship together. Thanks for taking some time. You too, Andrew. 